Welcome to the 2020 AFPPH Virtual Annual Meeting. I hope you are all staying well during these challenging times. I'm Laura Magaña, President and CEO of ASPPH, and I'm excited to announce that our, our in-person annual meeting has gone virtual to support the continuous commitment and engagement of our public health community in the local response to the coronavirus and in line with our collective responsibility to protect and promote the health and well-being of all while we stay connected and networking as a community. ASPPH virtual annual meeting after this week's kickoff program will be held on Fridays until May 15th, featuring key speakers and selected sessions. And I hope all of you can join the conversations. Each session is being recorded and will be available on our website. Today, our plenary session is Health Professionals for the 21st Century Report 10 years later with Dr. Julio Frank. I'm pleased to introduce today's session moderator, Dr. Hala Madanat. Hala is the chair of, the, of this year's annual meeting planning committee and director and distinguished professor of San Diego State University School of Public Health. Welcome, Hala. And now I will turn the session over to you to introduce our presenter. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining this 2020 ASPPH annual meeting virtual session. It's my pleasure to be moderating it. A decade ago, the report, Health Professionals for a New Century, Transforming Education to Strengthen Health Systems in an Interdependent World, was published in The Lancet. The lead author, Dr. Julio Frank, is president of the University of Miami and former dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He will present today on what has changed in the last 10 years. Are the findings still relevant and do they still address the challenges we face in the field today? It is my honor to introduce Dr. Frank. He's a scholar and a leader in higher education and global health. He became president of the University of Miami in 2015 and holds three academic appointments as professor of public health sciences, health sector management and policy and sociology. He previously served as the Dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. As Minister of Health of Mexico, he reformed the nation's health system and expanded access to healthcare for previously uninsured Mexicans. He also led the National Institute of Public Health of Mexico and has held top position as the World Health Organization, sorry, at the World Health Organization and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others. Thank you, Dr. Friend, for being with us today. Before I turn the time to you, I would like to remind everyone that you can ask questions in writing during the session by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will be holding any question until the end of the presentation. Dr. Frank, now I invite you to begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Madanat, for that kind introduction. And I want to start by thanking Laura Magaña for her kind invitation to um, participate in the ASPPH annual meeting. Of course, I was very much looking forward to meeting in person with uh, the set of deans who had been my colleagues even just five years ago when I decided to become a university president. But until then, I had the privilege of uh, being the dean of one of the member schools of the ASPPH and, and attended every annual meeting. Um, so again, my, my gratitude to Laura, uh, to the current uh, chair of the, of the board of directors of the association, Dr. Sandro Galea, and to all of my colleagues, I still think of all of you as my colleagues in the field of public health education. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, invitation was motivated because this year, 2020, marks the 10th anniversary of the Lancet Report on the Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century. Uh, that report itself was uh, uh, timed to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report, which as we all know was published in 1910 and launched a series of additional reports, including of course the Welsh Rose Report in, in 1916, uh, that shaped the education of health professionals around the world uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So 100 years later, in 2010, uh, when I was already serving as dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, it became clear that it was time to take a hard look at, uh, at, at health professional education. 
And what I want to do um, uh, today is to walk with you through some of the uh, analysis we've been doing about the, the, this 10th anniversary of that report, which of course is also the 110th anniversary of the Flexner report. Uh, the report itself was, um, a, a, was a, not focused only on medicine as the Flexner report, but actually took uh, a, a, a comprehensive view of all health professionals, except that it did focus in a major way on three of the professions, medicine, nursing, and public health. And it did contain some interesting quantitative information about the state of, 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 the, of professional education in those three fields uh, in, in, in 2010. So uh, I, I, I want to, um, with this motivated discussion of how do we revision education of health professions in the 21st century. My presentation will um, uh, have three main components. Uh, the first one is to uh, look uh, at what has what I would call a time of opportunity and then do a little bit of a retrospective assessment very briefly and then I think what is more interesting is look try to, to develop a, a prospective analysis into the future. So <clears throat> Let, let me start with the idea that we are truly at a time of opportunity. Of course, first, uh, here you see in, in this slide, the cover of the Lancet, the issue of the Lancet, was a regular issue of the Lancet in December of 2010, that contained this uh, report called Health Professionals for a New Century, Transforming Education to, strengthening health, to Strengthen Health Systems in an interdependent world. And it's the 10th anniversary that we are uh, 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 commemorating now. The progression of the slides is a little bit slow, so let me, let me move then to uh, what I think are a number of major trends that have characterized this period of time. First of all, I would say that there are three macro trends that are shown here. First of all, advances in the learning sciences. We understand better than ever the way adults and humans in general, but particularly adults, which is most of what we, we, the population we deal with, how adults learn. And those are uh, generating some insights into better pedagogical practices. Secondly, there's been huge advances in technology. For whatever reason, education was one of the few fields that did not experience a technological revolution during the 20th century. That revolution is happening now in the 21st century. And we have access to some technologies that, that, uh, that, that we hadn't had until fairly recently. And then very importantly, I think we are facing unprecedented changes to the labor market. Our graduates, are graduating into the most dynamic labor market in human history. As other advances in technology, particularly in automation and artificial intelligence, are changing the character of jobs. While students are in their programs in the university, new jobs are being creating, created and existing jobs are being disrupted. And that poses a very different set of challenges as we try to develop the competencies in our students. Now, the other thing uh, uh, that, that has uh, changed is that in these 10 years, as you can see in these slides, first of all, there's been a huge explosion of interest on educational reform. Actually, the Lancet report was published in 2010, and then just two years later, 2012, that it was declared by Time Magazine the year of the MOOC. If you remember, that was the year when massive open online courses really uh, uh, came into the scene uh, with the creation of entities like Coursera and edX, uh, <coughs> really developing platforms for massive access and a total redefinition of what online education me uh, meant. 
In this decade also, we saw the launch of the interprofessional education movement. And of course, the ASPPH has been a leader there in that interprofessional movement. And, and, and we have seen also the implementation of many reform efforts around the world. Uh, so it's been a decade of a lot of activity and our association has been right there at the forefront <clears throat> of, of, um, of, that, of, of many of those innovations. Uh, as you know, of course, in, in, for the 100th anniversary of the Welsh Rose Report, the, the one that was specifically addressed to public health education, uh, we also saw a, a, a wealth of initiatives spearheaded by the ASPPH. Now, let me <coughs> move to the second part and uh, offer uh, 10 years later a little bit of a retrospective assessment of what has been the impact of uh, the Lancet report before we go into the prospective analysis. Uh, the report has had an enormous impact in terms of citations. According to Google Scholar, it has accumulated more than uh, 4,000 uh, citations. Um, and we decided uh, with a research team here at the University of Miami and with a, um, the stewardship of my, uh, the co-chair of the Lancet Commission and my joint first author of the Lancet Report, Dr. Lincoln Chen, as well as uh, Dr. Harvey Feinberg, who when the report was launched was the president of the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine. We formed a research group to try to, to do this impact analysis of the Lancet report. Um, after a, a number of inclusion criteria that I won't go into, into the details, uh, we, we, we came up with about 2,000 um, articles and we have been doing a, a, a revision of each of those 2,000, actually a sample of 1,000 of those, a random sample of 1,000 of those, to try to tease out how the specific recommendations of the report have been uh, adopted or implemented. And just to um, uh, uh, boil down the, ess the essence of the, of the Lancet report of 2010, we divided our recommendations into two main groups. On the one hand, in, uh, recommendations regarding instructional reforms, and then on the other hand, institutional reforms. And that in a, little, in a sense mirrors the way the Flexner report was, um, was structured because the Flexner report obviously contained a lot of uh, recommendations on, on the instructional dimension, meaning what should we teach and how should we teach it? But it also answered the institutional questions of where should we teach? And in the case of the Flexner Report and the Welsh Rose Report for Schools of Public Health, it made a number of major institutional statements, like the fact that medical schools and schools of public health should be part of universities, for example. So echoing that duality in the Lancet Report of 2010, we follow those main uh, dimensions. Um, so we could address recommendations both on, on, on what and how to teach the instructional side, but also where to teach. And uh, we ended up with 10 main recommendations. I'm not gonna go into any detail. Um, I know that many of the deans, uh, as, as, as this report was evolving, uh, I presented uh, its results and the ASPPH was a major part of the effort. Um, and many of you have heard about it. Others, if you have not read the report, the report is obviously available and easily uh, uh, accessible at, at the Lancet. But we had six instructional um, uh, reforms in our proposals. First of all, really a, a very major statement about inter and transprofessional education. Transprofessional means that we, don't, uh, we extend the idea of interprofessional to include also the non-professional members of the health workforce, like community health workers. So we were very much endorsed the idea of, uh, of inter and transprofessional education. 
Secondly, at, uh, in 2010, we could already see the power of information and communication technologies. And even though this was two years before the year of the MOOC, it already endorsed or recommended the, the wholesale adoption of information and communication technologies. Uh, we introduced a notion of a new professionalism where um, a, a, a competencies were, would be used to design the boundaries around professions instead of the current silos we have among different professions and where we advocated for a common set of uh, shared uh, uh, values and codes of ethic across professions. We emphasized the need for educational resources, especially because this report took an, a, a global uh, perspective and many parts of the world just don't have access to those educational resources. So we advocated for open, uh, open resources in education, uh, which led to harnessing uh, some of those global uh, resources. And then finally, we were very much in favor of uh, competency-based curricula, where we started with the end in mind, what are the competencies? And then we work our way backwards to curricular design. On the institutional side, we proposed the enactment of joint planning mechanisms between health systems and educational systems to make sure that uh, educational systems are producing the quantity and quality of health professionals that are really required uh, in, in, in the health system. We spoke about moving from ac academic medical centers to really academic systems of, uh, for health professional education. We um, endorsed a culture of critical inquiry in all of our universities and, and other educational institutions. And finally, probably the boldest institutional proposal was to move uh, from our current institutional design where we have around the world uh, self-contained schools of medicine, of nursing, of public health, each of them trying to offer everything in, 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 by their own to the idea of building networks, alliances, and consortia of educational institutions with a global perspective. And the rationale here was that if we thought that each one of the more than 190 uh, member states of the United Nations would develop its full complement of, uh, by itself, its full complement of health professions that would be required, that, that is just not gonna happen. And we need to develop those networks and consortium alliances uh, with a global scope. So what has happened with uh, those uh, recommendations? In, in that very detailed um, a, a bibliographic analysis, we ended up, as I say, after a number of inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, with close to 2,000 distinct articles using Scopus and Web of Science, um, uh, uh, 2,164 unduplicated uh, citations. Also, these were only in the English language. We had to constrain this. There were many other citations in other languages as the Lancet report was translated into half a dozen languages, but we limited this to the English language citations. We did, as I was saying, a double blind review uh, 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 with three reviewers and then uh, had a random sample of a thousand citations. Here are some of the uh, results uh, of this very thorough, painstaking uh, exercise. And while we, uh, let me, I, I already mentioned that, and let me jump to the to the um, results. So we classified the uh, papers in three levels. Level one, uh, the the Lancet report was cited, but really uh, it was just a citation. There was no specific uh, uh, recommendation that was really elaborated on. Level level two actually does elaborate on one or more of the reforms and or the themes. Level one was about half, level two was about 27%. And then level three 
really uh, got inspiration from the Lancet report to present an innovation, an expansion, um, and, and, uh, and, an, and a novel approach that aligns with, with some of the, of the proposed reforms. So it, it was to me quite heartening that about a thousand uh, uh, articles were either in level two or level three. And, um, you know, about uh, 220 were really quite elaborate uh, discussions of reforms. Um, so uh, that, you know, is really a lot of activity because we do know also that there's a publication bias. There are many other reforms going on that are not publishing or are publishing in the great literature, which we couldn't search for this exercise. But it means that at least we have, you know, 250 uh, uh, approximately uh, experiences that are mature enough to be uh, 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 reporting in the, Eng in the searchable English language literature, which is a lot of activity that's been going on. And it reinforces our impression that this decade, there's been really a, ve a very interesting expansion of exploration and innovation in health professional education. Now we did classify uh, those level two and three papers, um, uh, those thousand uh, citations in, uh, in, in uh, around the, the, the 10 reforms that we proposed. And you can see the results. The most commonly or frequently measured, ma mentioned um, uh, reforms were by far the adoption of competency-based curriculum. This seems to be now a growing movement that instead of just following inertial um, curricular design, where basically, you know, current professors teach the same way they were taught, uh, people are really starting with the competencies and then working their way back into curricula, curricular design. And the second one, as you can see, 57% of those citations referred to competency-based curriculum. Um, the second one is, of course, inter- and transprofessional education. There's been an explosion of interest in that field. And then uh, the other reforms that were mentioned a little bit less, the third most, most uh, mentioned was the exploitation of the power of information and communication technologies, then the strengthening of educational res resources, a lot of discussion on ideas of a new professionalism for the 21st century and a few papers, and this is the, the only institutional reform that had any mention, uh, is the establishment of joint planning mechanisms in, in, in country between health systems and educational systems. Really, most of the other reforms were rarely, rarely mentioned. Um, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, uh, for example, what I thought was a very bold idea of linking uh, through networks, alliances, and consortia, really only 15% of the, of the papers even mentioned that idea. So in addition, we identified in this review some topics that are frequently mentioned in the papers published during this decade, but which were not present in the original Lancet report of 10 years ago. And one of them, which is really very important, is the, is the idea of social accountability that has been mostly around medical education, but some of the considerations are also applicable for uh, nursing and public health education. There's been quite a bit of discussion on, on, on professionalism, mostly on the ethical side, um, and a, a very interesting emerging topic is on work-life balance and, and the concept of professional burnout, which we really didn't even address in the Lancet report of 10 years ago. And much more attention, we, we mentioned that in the Lancet report, but much more attention to uh, the, not just the educational capacity building, but the research capacity building in low and middle income countries as research becomes an, a central ingredient of the educational enterprise itself. So you can also see this set of uh, topics that uh, we either did not include or barely mention that have gained uh, prominence in the decade since the Lancet report. 
Let me then move finally to the prospective analysis, which we're beginning. Uh, and you actually, you are getting the first report of this, both the retrospective analysis and the prospective deliberation is a dialogue that's ongoing. And I know that the ASPPH is at the, at the front lines of that dialogue, uh, of course, uh, with, with the whole exercise on uh, looking into the future. <clears throat> uh, what we have identified in, um, in this uh, prospective analysis is um, a number of emerging topics. And I'm just going to mention them. Um, we, uh, many of these came from a survey from original commissioners who were provided with the results of the literature review that I just mentioned. And that coupled with their own networks of relationships allowed us to compile this list. And I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, will think of others, uh, of other talks, to topics. Uh, a, a huge topic that again has gained in prominence uh, uh, it revolves around gender equity and the role of women in leadership. Uh, this decade has seen major progress in equality of educational opportunities, but not necessarily of occupational opportunities for women. So that topic is out there. I already mentioned the uh, uh, topic of health professional burnout um, and not just the individual level, but also system as system wide aspects, the way systems are designed that are actually uh, uh, putting at risk individual wellness and mental health of health professionals. Uh, a third topic has been the need to um, find new ways of certifying knowledge and measure capabilities. I think we have evolved from the concept of competencies, which conveys a very narrow set of skills to a broader concept of capabilities, which includes co complex cognitive capabilities. And we need to be able to certify that knowledge given the dynamism of the labor market that I was referring to. Uh, a lot of the discussion on the new professionalism has centered around conflicts of interest and corruption uh, of health institutions. And this is a global topic that, that is emerging and what is the role of educational institutions in also introducing some of those uh, capabilities in terms of ethical deliberation of uh, professional practice around professional practice into the curriculum. And then a number of topics regarding uh, financing, of course, the cost of medical education and other health professional education. This in the United States is of course a growing concern with the explosion of student debt. Uh, they continues to be, we documented it in the original Lancet report, but this has just grown in the intervening decade with the expansion of private for-profit, poor quality, uh, mostly medical schools, but also nursing and public health programs. And then I already mentioned the growth of the concept of social accountability. Finally, we find um, topics around governance both at the national level, national associations, but also uh, uh, at the global level. How should health professional education be, uh, be governed? And finally, um, be the, uh, uh, the topic beyond gender equity, other dimensions of diversity in, 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 in the health workforce. Um, The, the, the last set of emerging topics has to do with what I think is going to be a, um, a, a major emphasis of the next generation of, a, a, of educational reform. And I mentioned earlier the challenge represented by the dynamic nature of the uh, labor market. And what this is prompting us is to start thinking about cross-cutting generic capabilities, or what we used to call competence. As I said before, I prefer the term capability because uh, unfortunately in some quarters, the term competency refers to very narrow technical skills. And, and although we used it in a broader sense in the Lancet report, I think the term capability addresses not just those skills which are important, but also more complex uh, cognitive uh, capabilities. 
But as our students are graduating into this complex labor market, we need to think not just of their specialized uh, set of competencies, but also cross-cutting generic capabilities, which include uh, elements like critical thinking and ethical reasoning as crucial cross-cutting competencies where everyone or capabilities, where every student, doesn't matter what they specialize in, must, be, uh, must have developed that ability to think crit crit critically and reason in an ethical manner. Everyone should be graduating with very distinctive communication capabilities, both oral communication, communication, written communication, and increasingly visual communication. The offshoot of interprofessional education is the idea of capabilities around team building, and that requires the ability to understand and respect differing points of view, including a very difficult capability to develop, which is respectful disagreement, the ability to disagree respectfully and find constructive negotiated agreements to build teams. And that's at the core of inter and transprofessional education. Uh, and, and, and then finally, a fourth cross-cutting generic capability has been in pedagogy. We need to make sure that every one of our graduates understands the science and the art of teaching and learning, because many of our graduates will be themselves uh, in, those, uh, in, in those roles. So this, this has been a, 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 a growing conversation as we move toward what we call T-shaped individuals, T as the letter T, where until now we have emphasized the vertical part of the T, that is to say, deep, knowledge of a narrow field of specialization and that's very important because we still live in a world where specialized knowledge is very important but we also need that horizontal part which uh, uh, refers to those horizontal um, those common cross-cutting generic um, capabilities of the sort that i was enunciating and then finally i believe um, that although our institutional reform uh, regarding global forms of collaboration really hasn't had a, a lot of uptake. I think we need to double down on that, especially uh, when as we're living in this era of a lot of global retrenchment with the rise of populist discourse around the world, which a nationalistic and xenophobic discourse. I think more than ever, educational institutions need to reaffirm, we need to reaffirm that, uh, uh, that we stand for um, values that unite all of humankind and that we have a global engagement mindset because our main product, which is knowledge, is the quintessential global public good. And, and the idea that we live in an interconnected world as the current coronavirus crisis is reminding us is something that's inescapable and public health is clearly global health. In, in every aspect of, 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 of those, of, of both as a field of inquiry, but also as an arena for action and a field of professional practice. So I, I think doubling down on the original idea of global consortia is something very important. So let me finish in that vein by citing uh, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, the journal that uh, published the original report and who continues to have a lot of, uh, to exercise leadership in the global level. He recently, in an editorial, uh, wrote the following. He said, health workers have a vital voice in promulgating the idea of a common, not a divided humanity. Health leaders must begin to offer a positive and internationalist vision for human societies. And then he finishes, our task is urgent. So. I think this should be an inspiration, especially at this time. And I want to end with an invitation to each and every one of you. We're hoping once we finish this review uh, uh, that, and this revisioning towards the future, we are convening a meeting to be held here in Miami, Florida uh, on January 14th and 15th. This is 2021. By then, I am very confident we will have definitely won the war against the coronavirus and we will be able to enjoy what's uh, a, a very very nice uh, time of the year in Miami. A, a conference to really 
uh, together, come together around uh, the, that vision with leaders in uh, public health, nursing, medical, and other health professional education to uh, try to uh, agree on what that future uh, it, it, it looks like. Uh, so I, I hope with this to have given you a flavor, actually the first uh, sharing of what's work in progress as we continue to finalize and refine the impact assessment of the Lancet report of 10 years ago, and more importantly, to sharpen our common and shared vision for the future. Thank you very much. And now I hand it back to our moderator, Dr. Madanat. Thank you, Julio. We have some audience questions coming up. But, um, as a reminder, you can enter your questions by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many of the questions as we can over the remainder of this time. So I'll start us off with one question. Um, for the uncertain times that we live in and the ever-changing environment, what are crucial competencies or capabilities, as you called them, that our graduates need to have? Well, one of them is exactly, part of critical reasoning involves making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And that includes elements like understanding uh, probabilities, understanding being numerate in understanding data and being able to act upon. Now for us in public health, this is a, one of our core fields of, of, uh, of uh, instruction, but it's not the same in other health professions. And I think increasingly we need to understand decision-making under conditions of uncertainty, which always happens. It just happens that the uncertainty is, becomes more acute when we're dealing with crisis, like when every time there's a novel pathogen, which by definition, because it's new, the, 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 the crucial, the essential characteristic of this kind of, of pandemics is uncertainty because it's new because it's the first time that humans are encountering that pathogen we don't know for sure what is the course and we need to develop those uh, uh, that that capability of making decisions that is uh, decisions that are ethically informed but that are also informed by evidence even as we try to build on previous experience but knowing that our, we were doing that under conditions of uncertainty so that's exactly one of those cross-cutting generic com competencies or capabilities that I was talking about. And it is a core part of critical thinking. Thank you. Um, another question is, which I, I'm sure you is something you deal with all the time, but would love your perspective on um, how can we bring our faculty on board to constantly innovate the curriculum and the way we teach? That's a, an excellent question. <laughs> and, you know, uh, in the original Lancet report, we, we do talk a lot about, um, the, the, that, about the fact that the most challenging element in the implementation of some of these educational reforms is uh, the challenge of faculty development. Um, Higher education is a very powerful instrument of social reproduction. We all tend to teach the way we were taught. But precisely because we are at the threshold of a, an educational revolution, especially in higher education, as I mentioned at the beginning, we didn't have a technological revolution in the 20th century compared to other fields, compared this with healthcare itself. You know, we really didn't have major breakthroughs until the end, and today <clears throat> we really have a number of instruments that we did not have before. For example, high quality online education. I am not talking about the old style of online, which basically consisted of recording lectures and then uh, you know, disseminating them uh, to a, a, a solitary passive learner. I'm talking about online, online platforms that allow for active, interactive and personalized learning. Active means the relationship of the learning with the teaching material. You can now embed in an online material all kinds of multimedia resources, not just video, but also you can embed simulations. 
So it, 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 it really offers a platform for very active uh, learning. Interactive means the relationship of the learner to his or her fellow learners and to the instructors. So today we can create virtual classrooms where, where you have that interaction with, with, the, with the instructor, for example, and you're not just watching something that the instructor recorded uh, you know, days or months before and where you have no way of interacting with, with that person who should be guiding and mentoring. And the third is personalized, uh, where we can actually personalize content, where we can allow for self-paced learning uh, and embedding to those online uh, instruments uh, assessment tools that allow the learner to pace him or herself. And that's a whole new world of online uh, capabilities. The, the other is, of course, the explosion of mixed reality, uh, again, with huge educational uh, uh, potential, and in general, the growth of simulation tools, which for health professionals are very important. Simulation is a, a very powerful element because it allows us to mobilize a very, a very strong motivator for learning is to make a mistake. And simulation is a way of learning from our mistakes without hurting anyone. And this is why, you know, that's, that's the way we teach airplane pilots. We, we, we teach them in a simulator to land under a very rough conditions. If they crash the plane, no one gets hurt. So when the, when the real action happens, they, are, uh, they, they have the necessary competence to do that safely. More and more, that's a, 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 an invaluable tool for uh, health professions. Uh, we just built here at the University of Miami in our School of Nursing an entire simulation hospital where you simulate everything. It's been incredibly helpful now in preparing some of our own workforce that is dealing in our academic health system to deal with the current pandemic of coronavirus. So all of those, whether it's this new generation of active, interactive, and personalized online platforms, mixed reality platforms, simulation platforms, all of those um, uh, technologies are there, but the biggest uh, limiting factor right now is faculty development. And we need to really invest. My experience is that actually most faculty are excited by these possibilities, but most of us were taught to teach in a completely different set of formats. And we need to recycle ourselves to be competent to utilize these tools. One of the bright spots of the current pandemic is it has forced a large number of universities. I am sure most of your institutions, like mine, we've all gone into online uh, instruction. Uh, we, we, were, we, we had to very quickly tr transfer every single course we're teaching into an online format because we cannot have students uh, gathering in classrooms at this time when we're practicing social distancing. And that I think is, uh, you know, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And the silver lining of what's happening uh, with this, one of the silver linings with this uh, pandemic is that it's going to greatly accelerate the adoption of some of these technologies for, for distance learning. Um, uh, that, uh, and and it, it's, it has forced a lot of faculty, which until recently had been resistant to move to an online platform, uh, to actually embrace it. And many of our faculty members are discovering that it's actually a very powerful tool. So I, I think actually we'll see an acceleration of that faculty development, but that remains one of the biggest challenges in the implementation of reforms. And a lot of the papers that we reviewed mentioned that as one of the main limiting factors. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Um, there are structural barriers in higher education prevented us from innovating and moving forward. How have you as president of a university been able to confront them? And what advice would you have for the rest of us? Well, um, I, I think you mentioned uh, institutional barriers to innovation um, yeah, because uh, you, you, your voice faded a little bit, but if, if, uh, if I'm correct. Um, correct. Yeah, there are a, a, you are right. And uh, by the way, accreditation is one of them. 
And I am all for accreditation, especially as we've seen the expansion of private for, uh, for profit, non accredited, uh, very low quality uh, education institutions, uh, mostly in low and middle income countries. Uh, so I'm all in favor. But I think accrediting bodies need to embrace innovation um, so that, for example, a barrier to interprofessionalism has been uh, some of the accreditation requirements. Um, and I, I know that some of the accrediting bodies uh, in the health professions are, are now embracing that. But we need to be very innovative around that. The second barrier is, again, you know, most of us are part of universities and universities tend to develop silos. And we do know that the only way to, first of all, to make real progress around research that tackles complex problems is through interdisciplinary problem-based inquiry. Because problems are way too complex, they don't neatly uh, fall into the, the silos of our schools uh, and our departments. <clears throat> uh, yet a lot, and, and the same thing with education. Almost by definition, inter- and transprofessional education requires that we break those silos and that we collaborate across faculties. The problem we have is even within universities, a lot of institutional barriers like the criteria for promotion to tenure are hugely dependent on um, peer review mechanisms that are based on disciplines. So again, here we are actively trying to introduce new forms of valuing that interprofessional or an interdisciplinary work um, so that, that, that those institutional incentives, counter incentives that, uh, to, to interdisciplinary collaboration can be uh, uh, demolished. Uh, so there's a lot to do in the design, both of uh, institutions of higher education themselves and also some of the accredit accrediting uh, entities and criteria for accreditation that are there. But I think we're, we're all quite aligned. Everyone says we want more of this interdisciplinary work, both in research and in education. Um, and I think there is a will to move forward with some of these institutional reforms. A, a follow up to your, um, to your interprofessional education comments is um, how can we move forward to a more interprofessional integrated curriculum um, among health professionals, but more importantly, beyond the, the health professionals, especially now that we are facing a great opportunity because of the coronavirus and everybody having a better understanding of prevention and health promotion. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things I am proud of the original Lancet report is um, that we did introduce that concept of transprofessional education. The report came out in 2010. It was the 100th anniversary of the Flexner report. So there were many other very, very good reports that came out that year. Um, and practically all of them emphasize interprofessional education because I do think it's a major trend across whether it's medicine, nursing, public health, other health professionals. Um, but I think we were the first report that said that we also endorsed that general uh, consensus around the need for interprofessional education. But we introduced the concept of transprofessional education. And by what we meant by that was that we also need to bring on board the non-professional part of the health workforce, which in most low and middle income countries can be a very substantial, sometimes even, especially in low-income countries, the majority of the health workforce. Um, I'm talking here of uh, uh, community health workers, for sure. Uh, I'm talking about uh, health educators that may be doing a lot of the health promotion work at the community level, and who sometimes do that without a professional degree. They, they you know, may have attained maybe the equivalent of secondary education, but not post-secondary education. Um, and even in the post-secondary world, we have a lot of people who are not at the professional level, but more at the technical post-secondary level. Um, they are a large part of the health workforce, even in, the, in, in developed countries. So uh, it is 
crucially important that we understand that the health team, the team approach includes the non-professional part of the workforce. And that's the concept of transprofessional education. Now that is a challenge for schools that are university based because we tend not to have those uh, schools or those that, that kind of training in universities almost by definition. Uh, we are higher education. So uh, one challenge for us is whether, uh, you know, at the, at the um, at university level to encourage educational experiences when we have field placements, internships, uh, uh, practical experiences, practical immersive experiences, make sure that they include uh, this other component of the workforce and that we very deliberately and thoughtfully include in the education of our professionals some of those capabilities that will enable them to build teams in a transprofessional world. And that, for example, salient among that is uh, intercultural uh, competencies. Uh, understanding intercultural literacy, understanding how to communicate effectively and build teams across different cultural uh, boundaries, including in, in many contexts, different cultural views, cultural views about health and disease. That I think is an exciting frontier. Some of the curricula that, we, that we've reviewed in this, the curriculum reforms, actually now include cultural competencies as part of the, of the competency map. Um, so I, I think there's a, a huge uh, area of opportunity there uh, as, as we think of these comprehensive teams in many, many settings, um, the, the professionals will be a, a part of, of the team, but not the whole thing. The other, and with this I will finish, a related challenge that we have in interprofessionalism is we have the challenge of working better within the health professions. Within the health professions, most progress has been done with clinical, the, the clinical part of health professions that are in direct patient care, with individual patient care. It's been harder to bring public health professionals who deal with entire populations into that picture, although we have some examples. But there's one uh, frontier there. And then this, if, if you think of concentric circles, we've made most, pro most progress in the innermost circle, which is interprofessional education among, among the clinical professions, the ones in direct patient care. Second circle is bringing in the public health professionals that deal with the entire population. And the third one is the non-health professionals who work in health. For example, administrators. Many health managers are trained in schools of public health, but many are not. And they perform generic business functions in large complex health organizations. And therefore, even though they are not strictly speaking health professionals, they are general managers, they work in a healthcare setting. I'm talking about lawyers. In the United States, it is not surprising that because healthcare is the largest sector of the economy, you know, with over 18% of GDP, uh, it is also the largest uh, source of employment for lawyers today is either directly in healthcare organizations or around healthcare issues, including litigation, including regulation. So there's this whole host of non-health professionals working in health that we also need to create experiences for interprofessionalism between the health professionals strictly and this larger set of health professionals that work in health but are not health professionals uh, and, and have not been socialized as such. And, and so I think the, the interprofessional education movement needs to really expand across those three circles uh, so that we have teamwork uh, across the entire spectrum and then also in the other direction to, to expand into the non-professional part of the health workforce. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to take us now to um, a finding that wasn't in the original report, but that you've observed in this follow-up, which is the work-life balance and professional burnout. 
Can you tell us, give us examples of how do you think we can address some of these issues within our schools and programs of public health? And there was a follow-up question related to um, what the schools and programs themselves can do to support right now the health professionals that are overwhelmed, that might be facing burnout, mental health. Uh, uh, support that they might need with the coronavirus specifically? Yeah, it's become uh, sadly a very, very prominent issue because we're, we're facing it for everyone who's on the front lines. And that, of course, includes not just uh, our, uh, our colleagues who are in, in, in the clinical side of things, but at this stage, particularly, the enormous amount of public health uh, professionals that are out on the field, uh, uh, both doing work of surveillance, work of, of testing, uh, and and, uh, and 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 this is a, a, a real risk. I mean, at the edu with, with our students, I think, uh, you know, as I said, we did not address that issue in the original Lancet report, but we were, I think, pleasantly surprised with how prominent it became in this literature review. And I think it is a reflection of the growing, um, a, the growing trend towards health professional working in large organizations. Now for us in public health, this has been our history, but for the clinical professionals, particularly the MDs, uh, the physicians, um, I think you're seeing a major switch uh, with basically the disappearance of solo independent professional practices and larger and larger numbers of that part of the prof health professionals working now in large complex organizations. Um, and that does echo a, a theme that we did introduce in the original Lancet report, which was the need for health professionals to be competent, not just about the technical content, but also not just about the content, but about the context of their practice. And that includes understanding the organizational con context where you practice and also the policy context um, in which we operate. And I think uh, there are some elements of system design that uh, explain or determine some of those high levels of burnout. We need to, of course, have short-term responses with counseling services, with, but we need to, to, to have system design issues uh, so that um, working conditions do not lead to those expressions of, uh, of burnout. Uh, and that is going to be a particularly acute issue now. I think what we're doing now is, of course, deploying uh, resources uh, to support our frontline health workers and health professionals. Um, but, but this has to be a longer term fix, not just in response to the current pandemic. I want to thank you, Dr. Frank, for sharing your expertise and for all our, our audience for their attention and for their thoughtful questions. Um, and um, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the ASPPH website. As we close out the session, uh, we would like to ask our audience to please take a minute to uh, provide feedback via a brief survey. Um, Zoom will di display it directly into your web browser. I also want to mention finally that we are displaying on your screens right now the upcoming virtual annual meeting sessions, which you can learn, um, uh, which you can learn more about from our website at ASPPH. And um, this concludes our webinar for today. I thank everyone for joining. And again, a special thank you to you, Dr. Frank, for all of your time for an exciting and insightful presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.